Welcome to the online lecture on uh, the work of the EU Council and the European Council, two institutions of the EU. My name is Ilse Ruse and I'm professor at the Rio Verde School of Law and uh, I will deliver this online course um, aside with other courses on the Commission, the European Parliament and an online course on European integration. This course is uh, recorded, recorded in the framework of Jean Monnet Chair project at RGSL with the name EU at RGSL. This project is aiming at teaching EU subjects, EU politics, EU institutions, EU decision making by using different innovative methods, including also online teaching. So, let's get started. In my slide here you see two buildings on uh, Schumann Platz in Brussels. So this is the seat of uh, the Council of the EU and next to this building there is a new brand new building of the European Council. This allows us to think that actually we are speaking about two different institutions. At the same time, the Council and the European Council represent interests of the Member States' governments. So, how do, how do we view uh, these two institutions with respect to their functions, uh, with respect to um, the, um, uh, the, um, their structure, uh, participants, and also uh, the objectives uh, they are here uh, in the Treaty of Lisbon uh, to attain. So, with respect to the um, Treaty of Functioning of the EU, um, known also as Lisbon Treaty, Article 13 of the treaty explains that uh, the institutional framework shall aim to promote unions' values, advance its objectives, but also represent uh, interests of the member states, uh, citizens, and ensure it in a consistent and effective way. We have a list here of uh, EU institutions and among these uh, institutions we see the European Council and the Council of the EU as two separate institutions. This is innovation of the Lisbon Treaty because uh, before the Lisbon Treaty was in place uh, uh, 2009 so the previous treaties, like Treaty of Nice, Treaty of Maastricht and, and treaties before, uh, they singled out one institution that represents member states' interests and it was the Council. What we see now with this um, legal change in the treaties, setting up like European Council as a single out separate institution, uh, we see that its role is increasing as an institution and we will speak about it later, but now I think um, it's important to uh, see what differences are between these two institutions and what do they have in common. So, in the next slide I have um, outlined the principle that actually which unites both institutions is that uh, they consist of the members of the member states' governments, so delegates from the member states' governments. And both institutions represent national interests of these member states' governments, so the national interests of 27 uh, member states. So, if we compare all the listed institutions um, in Article 13 of the Treaty, uh, 
we can see that these two, the Council and the European Council, are those who would carry out the, 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 the functions and, and their decision-making mode in an intergovernmental way. So meaning that the member states' interests, um, interaction between the member states matter. Uh, so uh, we know from the theories of European integration that uh, we have both intergovernmentalism and neo-functionalism, which argue that supranational uh, mode of governance uh, matters more. Uh, here we see intergovernmental, you know, the, the pillars, two intergovernmental pillars um, in, in scope of these two institutions. At the same time, the differences are also quite remarkable. And the differences, first of all, the differences in uh, terms of uh, level of representation, because in um, the European Council, in this institution, the member states will be represented on the highest level, on the level of heads of states, whereas the Council has a representation starting from the civil servants, like expert level, up to ambassadors, diplomatic level, and then up to ministers. We will speak about it in detail um, in coming uh, minutes, but I think it's important here also to point out this distinction that the Council of the EU is a legislative institution. Hence, we have these different levels that would take part in negotiations in um, court decision or in ordinary legislative procedure. Whereas, European Council does not have legislative function. European Council is institution dealing uh, its, its actually tasks and um, its, its mandate is uh, rather to set the political course on intergovernmental uh, level for, for Europe, uh, but also to deal uh, with issues of uh, high political importance. It may be crisis, it may be also processes that, that are um, you know, um, scheduled and, and uh, have a, like European semester. Uh, it would deal with uh, very important aspects of enlargement, uh, future widening of the European Union, um, the European Council is the body that would deal with the revision of treaties. We know that almost every fifth or tenth year, um, by now, by Treaty of Lisbon, there have been always a necessity to change a treaty, to revise a treaty. And then this would be within the intergovernmental conference, where the heads of state would have this a mandate to, at the highest level, to deal with the treaty changes. So um, this is distinction, we will go step by step into detail, but just to say and once again argue that the composition of these two bodies is quite similar because of member states being represented, but the tasks and also the procedures are, are very different. So, then let's get started with the Council of the EU. So, one of the institutions, Council. Well, Council is one of the main functions of the Council is just to deal with legislative work. If we compare the decision-making of, of the Union uh, with, to some extent, also with the decision-making in, in the member states, uh, we can find some similarities uh, with the decision-making where the parliaments, for example, in the member states had two chambers. And to some extent, we can also say that in the EU, when legislating, uh, one of the chambers would be council, also uh, being represented here by the member states' governments, 
27, and the European Parliament, which is directly elected a supranational institution, so being the other chamber. So, Article 289 states that in normally ordinary, therefore it's called ordinary legislative procedure, so this would consist of joint adoption uh, by the European Parliament and Council of Legislative Acts. And the proposals of these legislative acts would come from the Commission. So in the lecture on the Commission, we have looked closely in, the, in this um, monopoly of initiative right of uh, the Commission and also how the Commission includes the um, civil society, stakeholders, other institutions in, in, in consultation procedure, including uh, creating um, a green book uh, or white, uh, um, green paper or white paper um, uh, instruments. But here we will speak actually about these two legislators and one of them being council. So again, uh, next slide will in, um, in a very um, illustrative way um, explain what I, what, what I just um, um, quoted from article 289, uh, that on the commission's proposal, uh, which is simultaneously sent to both legislators. So, meaning that in the Council it arrives in the mailboxes of 27 uh, governments. And we don't uh, have uh, like this sending mails uh, principle when we speak about legislative proposals. Rather, we say that it is just a, a modern digital. Um, approach, there is extranet system uh, where these proposals are placed and then the governments get a notification from extranet there is the new commission proposal arrived. So at the same time the uh, European Parliament also receives uh, the commission's proposal and uh, the processes start in parallel. And in this co-decision procedure, uh, in three steps, in first, second and third reading, um, there is agreement between the legislators. It may happen that the agreement is already on the first uh, reading level, but the, the condition is that both institutions are engaged. So they have to wait um, until the other institution has actually given its view. So the European Parliament can amend it and then the, European, the Council of the EU has to, uh, to actually scrutinize um, these amendments and respond. So let's speak now about the, um, the structure uh, of the Council of the EU um, its different levels and actually who is present at this legislative work. So let's start with the location. In my introduction slide um, I was uh, uh, introducing you to the um, uh, actually to these two, uh, the place where the council uh, works in, in Brussels and um, on Schumann Platz uh, the council has a building um, which actually mainly consists of meeting rooms, because we are speaking here about negotiations between the member states. So the Council has to agree internally uh, before it gives an opinion to other institutions. So to reach this agreement between 27 member states, to negotiate internally takes a lot of time. And uh, who is doing this? Who is doing this long negotiation work, starting article by article, going through these uh, legislative proposals that arrive from the Commission? So, uh, how do the uh, work is? How does uh, member states manage to uh, approve this joint approach, uh, general approach, as said in the first reading, and then agree on also on the amendments uh, made by European Parliament? So the participants from uh, the member states can first 
this process is started on a civil servants level. So the member state delegates are experts, civil servants. Uh, they come together in so-called working groups, the council working groups, which is the expert level of the council negotiations, internal negotiations in one of the legislative bodies. Two options possible. Either they would travel to Brussels from the member states just for the meeting where the council negotiates on this uh, particular dossier and or the member states also have their permanent representations in Brussels, their diplomatic missions. In, uh, in these permanent representations in Brussels there will, would be then councillors, attaches representing specific policy fields so that uh, the member state, whenever there is a meeting on particular legal act, so the person in charge, either from the capital or the, from permanent representation, would get an invitation to travel or to arrive in the meeting uh, which is set up by the presidency. So, I have also to, um, to make here a, a small note of that the delegations arrive here um, in, um, in a very organized way. So this is um, upon invitation from the Council Secretariat. Also uh, beforehand they get documents distributed that are foreseen for these internal negotiations from this particular, for this particular meeting. And uh, no other attendees would be invited. So the council negotiations are quite restricted to the participants of the member states. Only other actors present in these internal council negotiations are the Commission, because Commission has provided the legal draft. So the Commission always is present and uh, can comment and uh, respond to the questions uh, of the presidency or any of the member states. But also the presidency that would chair this meeting, meaning that the mediator of these internal negotiations, uh, would be supported by a council secretariat on one side and the legal service on the other side. And then also the council uh, provides the um, possibility of interpreter interpretation uh, when necessary. But mainly the internal council work, the internal negotiations, actually take place in uh, three working languages. So please note, not official languages, but working languages. And these working languages are English, French, German. So, the meetings are scheduled and chaired by Council Presidency and it will be the Council Presidency deciding how often they plan to call the delegates from the Member States to arrive uh, for discussions. And it would depend on Council Presidency's working programme, so if they have envisioned to adopt a legal act within framework of their presidency, then possibly there will be quite often meetings, uh, a very tight schedule um, and uh, foreseen for, for reaching compromise, not only internally within council, but also between council and the European Parliament. So, as explained, the work will be carried out uh, on different levels and start with the level of experts. So whenever possible, experts will agree on the uh, provisions or on the, on the articles uh, of the legal act, of the legislative proposal, um, and uh, they would not return back to this um, issue uh, once the agreement between the member states is, is reached. Um, so those issues who have been agreed, so there are no uh, 
differences between the members of, of the Council, they would be marked as so-called A issues, like A issues. And A issues, uh, the more the better. So um, then there would be some issues um, that still the countries are very divided, so that there are national interests um, and possibly even coalitions around, so like-minded groups, um, so that uh, at the expert level no further compromise is possible. In such case, the presidency would decide to lift this issue up to the next level of negotiation, and this will be done by ambassadors. So, in the slide you see the level of so-called COREPER ambassadors, which is an acronym which actually explains the Permanent Representatives Committee and if you make this, uh, the acronym from French language, you get the acronym CORREPER. So, CORREPER ambassadors would meet up to twice a week. In some cases, they also have uh, special sessions, even in the evenings or in exceptional cases during weekends. But normally, this would be kind of planned, planned work of ambassadors meeting regularly every week and uh, collecting at this format of ambassadors level the issues that have been left from the expert meetings where experts were not able to agree um, among uh, themselves so civil servants actually have had you know limitations to find a compromise and the question is then, oh, well, how can then ambassadors do the work better? Because in many cases, uh, we are speaking about really technical issues, so very technical provisions. So may it be like uh, the uh, agriculture or energy and, or um, internal market or digital signal market or, or even like Eurozone and, uh, and uh, foreign affairs. So, um, we will speak about Coreper ambassadors a bit later, but uh, the main um, explanation why ambassadors level is included in this negotiation before it goes up to ministers. So, the formal reason is that the treaty says that Coreper ambassadors prepare meetings of the ministers. So, this is, you know, the, uh, the level before political level, so diplomatic level. In practice, Coreper ambassadors are, for the first, they are very experienced diplomats. So very senior diplomats with vast experience also in negotiating. But the fact that uh, they get dossiers from different policy fields uh, means that they can um, see also some kind of package deals. So they can make um, concessions by, um, by um, leaving uh, some issues really as priority issues for the member states, but being able to make concessions on others. Because for European decision-making work, it's very important that countries can agree so that the process is moving forward. And so there is a very strategic way of, you know, ambassadors deal on this level of issue linkage, on uh, um, deciding which issues of the member state are really priority issues. So there's also a lot of um, uh, networking. It's a lot also of uh, cooperation. Uh, which allows, you know, in the theories of European integration to speak about also um, constructivist approach because that also the, the, the atmosphere in European negotiation uh, encourages also countries a bit to move away from very strict preferences to more cooperative way, to more general uh, interest in, in Europe. So, once Corporate ambassadors have done their work, it goes up to ministers. And only 20%, approximately 20%, are left for these political level negotiations. 
and we call them B issues. So uh, normally the A issues will be adopted without uh, any discussion, just uh, one single agenda item. And then the, the main ministerial meeting uh, focus will be on these remaining outstanding issues on, um, on the Legal Act. Uh, so, speaking about ministers, here we have in the next slide uh, different council formations. So, we have ministerial councils in environment, in justice and home affairs, in competitiveness, agriculture and fisheries, and so on. Uh, so, altogether, we have 10 council formations, but it's very important also to note that um, as an institution, it's one council. So this is possible in practice that an A issue from agricultural council can be adopted uh, while justice and home affairs ministers meet. So just passing it because the ministers have to rubber stamp uh, the uh, agreement on the minister's level as political agreement. And you see here among um, all the councils, one is a bit slightly different, as I have marked it in different color, and this is the Foreign Affairs Council. And the Foreign Affairs Council is different because, and in particular after 2009, that this meeting is chaired, it's led by the permanent uh, position in the, in the treaty bodies, it is High representative, vice the president of the commission, um, and uh, so high representative would be always leading negotiations between the member states in on the topics of foreign affairs. Whereas when uh, the foreign affairs uh, council would include issues on trade, in these cases there would be the presidency in charge of leading negotiations. Then one interesting aspect is the um, difference between um, the thematic councils and general affairs council. So what is then the task of general affairs uh, council here? And um, the treaties and the revision of treaties, there were different ideas how to use this body but at the end, the agreement was that General Affairs Council will prepare the work of European Council, so heads of state meeting, and the General Affairs Council would discuss issues of horizontal nature, let it be multi-annual financial framework, or the macro-regional strategies, or inter-institution um, uh, agreement and relations between institutions and so on. It's important also to, um, to mention here that General Affairs Council will be one where the enlargement issues will be handled. And uh, the um, Minister of European Affairs, if a country has such a position, or in other cases Minister of foreign affairs would represent country in this format and this council formation will be um, chaired by the presidency minister, either European minister of Europe or minister of foreign affairs. So this is different between the foreign affairs council and general affairs council. Um, but um, in, 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 in general we can uh, understand this logic also by the fact that the General Affairs Council will be the forum of uh, preparation of heads of states. Good, let's now um, come to a task that I have put in my slides. I will not comment it, I will not even give you an answer. This will be something to think about. On the pic here in the picture we see uh, the Commissioner for Budget and Human Resources and we see Minister of Foreign Affairs. It was during the Romanian Presidency. Both uh, like uh, persons are here giving the press conference and I'm wondering which council is it? Which council formation is it? So this is something for you.
to think about. Now let's go back to the different levels of participation in the Council work and speak a bit about diplomatic staff. And here we have uh, not only one ambassador, but even two ambassadors. So they are um, assigned different policy fields. We have Codeper 2 ambassador, supported by senior diplomat, and the name of this group of supporting Codeper 2 ambassador is Antici, actually following the family name of one of the first diplomats who, who like, made this um, uh, first format of, um, of uh, interaction supporting Corporate Ambassadors. So, um, and the same for Corporate One, also here, uh, the supporting group was framed uh, um, after the family name of the one Belgian diplomat at that time, and now the whole meeting is called Mertens meeting. So these are two levels of um, core per ambassadors, but not like uh, levels in terms of uh, seniority. Uh, I have still to mention that core per two is uh, the ambassador extraordinary plenipotentiary of the permanent of the permanent mission in Brussels. But um, you see here that core per two deals with foreign affairs, economic and financial affairs, justice and home affairs, and general uh, affairs council. So these would be issues um, uh, that are mainly, in many cases, have been intergovernmental. There are a lot of national interests in the scope of these issues. Uh, so we call in um, international relations this high politics. So these issues are very close to uh, the heart of member states because they are very close to, also to member states' sovereignty issues. And the other um, uh, group of, of, of aspects or, or, or um, um, other part of Corpor is dealing with um, internal market, with community matters. And here we have um, um, all the um, internal market uh, um, fields like competitiveness, agricultural, environmental, transport, and you name it. So this is distinction between the ambassadors so that they would meet in different dates. They would have meetings on uh, their particular agendas and uh, uh, try to prepare their uh, the ministers of respective countries for the negotiations at particular uh, council formation. Um, so here you have uh, the tasks of Corapair being set by the treaty, a preparing task of work of council, and the Corapair ambassadors are also in many cases um, actually re if the minister has no possibility to travel to Brussels for meeting, so the corporate um, ambassador can replace and sit uh, in the seat of the member states minister uh, during the negotiations and has actually the same power as, um, as to represent the country, except that the corporate ambassador cannot represent the heads of state, so there is a limitation. As uh, you see the negotiation table here, with a picture of the round table uh, where the delegates sit in the front line, and then you have uh, the delegations um, sitting behind. Normally there is one plus five, so that the ministers can also rely on expertise of ambassador, of uh, uh, the councillor from a permanent representation, also delegation from the capital following. Um, and the negotiation uh, table seating is fixed, so um, as a Latvian delegate I would always have uh, Luxembourg and Italy on my side. So this is fixed. This, um, the, the seating arrangement was adopted, taking into account geographical balance, also countries that, um, that um, were, um, had accession to the EU uh, a bit later, so that there would be also kind of 
learning policy learning patterns but in you know so many years after being part of this EU work I don't see that there is any old and new member states I think um, since countries including Latvia we have undergone our through our EU presidency so all EU member states actually are um, equal negotiators around this table. So the presidency currently, um, this year, um, this half a year presidency, German presidency being supported by legal service and council secretariat, and on the uh, other side of the room there would be the seat of the European Commission. So this is a negotiation table, and the countries um, in all the, uh, all the uh, council formations uh, the work is led by the rotating presidency, uh, which takes a seat for six months, but the presidencies are interacting with the previous presidency and following presidency. So we are speaking about presidency trios and about the program of presidency, which lasts for 18 months. Um, so the good presidency is considered to be a good and neutral and efficient presidency in terms of delivering. And um, we here also on the slide, uh, if you click the link, you will get the list of the upcoming presidencies of the EU up to 2030. So country Latvia, where I come from, will have the next presidency in 2028. Time passed fast, so this is something that, uh, you know, uh, we countries are preparing along in advance because it's a, an, a, a huge responsibility uh, to become the leader or, or of the uh, council work, uh, council being one of negotiation, uh, uh, the legislative bodies. Now, how do the Council um, the vote? It's very important because the uh, decision has, um, is con considered to be passed uh, when there is um, support from Council. So there are three ways of voting. You see in the slide simple majority, qualified majority voting and unanimity voting. Um, so, simple majority voting mainly is used in some uh, technical voting cases on, uh, on method, on, on rules, on, on procedures, uh, but most common currently, even default, uh, default voting rule is qualified majority voting. Uh, but when the issues have a high level of sensitivity for member states, then still unanimity applies. So what does it mean for a country uh, to vote with qualified majority voting? So this would mean that uh, the uh, voting of qualified majority is mainly applied uh, when the um, proposal is passed by co-decision, by ordinary legislative procedure, and in most cases when either the competence is uh, exclusive or shared, so then also the qualified majority voting will be in place. Um, so it means that as from 2017, as set in Lisbon Treaty, the decision is passed if the uh, decision is supported by 55% of the member states, so meaning the number of member states amounts to 55%, uh, it is now 15 member states from 27, so there has to be positive improvement, uh, like a positive vote uh, from 50, 15 member states, and uh, that it is also um, supported, or this positive vote is represented by 65% of population. So um, it is quite difficult to calculate it. I will show you some insights how this is done, this calculation. But the principle is easy, so that the, actually the, uh, the member states vote um, with respect to uh, the size of their population also, so that 
and the, the, so the larger member states uh, would, would have uh, more weight in, in their vote, qualified majority vote, um, but not to, um, to limit also power of, uh, of smaller member states. Uh, so there is also or actually population that, um, that has to be taken into account. There is also uh, a condition that if 35% of population would stand behind um, the blocking vote, then the countries can block the decision. So they can actually stop the application, uh, which is so called blocking minority. So 35% of population can reach blocking minority. It sounds quite complex. Let us have a look on next slide in a graph. How, how does it look in practice? So what are the conditions of qualified majority voting? So for the council uh, to positively pass agreement, you would need like 15 member states uh, that are behind this decision and also 65% which could respond approximately 330,000 people because about 500,000 inhabitants, citizens, European citizens in Europe. Um, so 65% would be if we see the uh, now the um, proportion of countries uh, with the uh, number of citizens in each country uh, and so make summarize this and 65% is reached so, the, uh, so these conditions have to be met to pass a decision by both majority voting and blocking minority would mean that 400 countries have to support the actually the uh, aspect to stop this, to apply, uh, block it, um, and uh, this would mean um, 179,000 people would then stand behind this blocking minority. Um, there has been a lot of discussions and uh, my slide also shows you a study um, that was made uh, recently also with, with uh, respect to the uh, the Brexit um, uh, possibly um, taking place um, soon. So what will be now the vision of uh, future 27 countries and their uh, power? And um, here the discussion was about, uh, for example, Baltic-Nordic cooperation, uh, where also we take into account some countries, like-minded countries, um, that would come um, in one coalition, are they able to, to reach this blocking minority? And this is difficult. For, um, for less populated countries, it is indeed difficult to uh, get to the threshold of blocking uh, minority. So, um, so this also shows that countries have to cooperate they have to interact. There's a lot of networking in Brussels. There's a lot of networking between the capitals. So this also allows member states to be better prepared uh, for these decision-making um, uh, moments uh, in the council. Um, I leave you here um, a practical task that you can carry out on your own. Uh, so there was um, one of directives uh, that uh, where we had uh, like physical voting because normally in qualified majority voting uh, there is not like physical rising hands. Uh, everyone knows as from the start of negotiations on the working group level uh, what the spirit of agreement is and uh, so that uh, there's no surprises at the level of minister that suddenly would uh, vote against. Uh, but when the qualified majority voting applies, so it's of course um, uh, in cases where the countries absolutely cannot agree, uh, they can either vote against or they can abstain. And uh, one of these voting um, uh, occasions was in 2017 uh, when adopting the directive 
on posting of workers. And uh, then the, the, uh, some countries voted against. And my task here uh, for, for your um, individual work is, is actually aiming at, for the first, um, I invite you to visit a tool which is a voting calculator. There is a voting calculator. There's even an application on iPhone where you can um, calculate the voting outcome. But use this voting calculator and answer the question whether decision is passed um, when some of countries voted against and some abstained and um, whether there was blocking minority possible and if countries uh, actually were left in minority, those who were voting against, what would be the next steps and next strategies for these countries actually to, um, to carry on their national interests, uh, both on the council level, but also think about the next step that this will go for first reading uh, in the European Parliament, so that it's also co-legislating um, powers with another institution. So the member states have many strategies how they can actually affect the outcome of uh, the negotiation um, of the legislative work. So, I'm asking also you a question, is it possible uh, for a country uh, that is not present to ask for help another country to vote for it. And Article 239 actually gives this um, option, but it limits that the countries uh, can vote on behalf of no more than one other member. So this is possible, but only one other member. Finally, when speaking about co-decision, uh, we need also to understand that uh, the uh, levels of decision-making um, here in the ordinary legislative procedure will be first, second and third reading. So there will be three readings where the both institutions, Council and European uh, Parliament will interact. Um, I will give more insight on the role of European Parliament and on this interaction between both institutions during my lecture on European Parliament. But now I would like to lead you away from the Council of the EU and introduce the European Council, another institution representing Member States' interests. So recently we've got in Brussels brand new European Council building. It's a transparent, beautiful architecture. Uh, the building actually having a lot of colors uh, also in the main negotiation call. And you can see from the picture here on the slide that the European Council uh, setting is much more limited so there are heads of state, but there is no second row with delegations. So there is much more, you know, political uh, trust in these negotiations. And um, so this is limited to heads of states only, and they are supported by interpreters. And uh, also the sessions uh, that are led by the permanent president of the European Council, currently Charles Michel, uh, so they are set up in a way that on really sensitive issues, most likely there will be kind of informal setup like lunch or dinner, where the heads of state can in a very trustful manner uh, discuss the pos possible you know, ways of agreement. So uh, the council was established actually uh, not in the original um, treaty. So the Treaty of Rome doesn't uh, offer you the institution like European Council. Uh, but it came up in the 60s as uh, after the Hague summit, the ideas uh, that came after the um, France was actually also triggering this intergovernmental way of 
interaction in, in the EU. Um, the, at that time, President de Gaulle uh, was very much concerned about the, the states, the nation, the, the, the member states' um, interests also being part of a European project. Um, so it started with informal summit uh, meetings, but then step by step uh, took the shape of institution. So the first European Council meeting took place in 1974, and uh, with next uh, every treaty, the single European Act, with Maastricht Treaty, with Amsterdam Treaty, it became more and more powerful and Treaty of Functioning of European Union, uh, Treaty of Lisbon, made it a formal institution. So, what is then the main tasks, task of, uh, of the European Council? When we were discussing the Council's role, we were very much focusing on legislative work. The European Council is not a legislator, so it is set up in the Article 15 saying that um, the European Council is not even allowed to exercise legislative functions. But what is expected from the European Council is that it will provide political direction of the EU, and it will deal with highly political matters. Uh, possibly with um, external crisis, internal crisis, the revision of treaties, uh, the um, enlargement uh, decisions on enlargement, uh, issues like multi-annual financial framework, which would set up the future financing um, agreement uh, for the EU, um, and also it has a role in uh, nominating high-level positions in, in the EU. So, um, which means now that uh, the, the provisions and the, the expectations from European Council um, is, is much more political, um, the treaty says that the Council, European Council should meet uh, four times a year um, meaning two times per presidency, whereas in practice we have now much, much more frequent meetings, um, also because of Brexit, uh, which is an uh, internal you know, um, issue to be settled uh, um, according to Article 50, withdrawal clause, uh, but also uh, so that the European Commission here on Brexit works very closely with the European Council because the main negotiator with, um, here on the Brexit file is actually the Commission and the European Council um, is, is a partner here to the Commission taking these political decisions. Um, so uh, we have uh, more quick, frequent meetings uh, than only set by, by the treaty and which is important now to also hear to mark that the heads of states agree on unanimity. So countries can veto, a single country can veto. On the European Council, the voice, the, 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 the vote uh, of Malta would have the same impact as the vote of France or Germany. So one vote against means that there, uh, the, there is a veto, that the, the, the decision cannot be taken. In some cases, Council, European Council deals with qualified majority voting, in particular uh, procedural cases, but the overall spirit is that on this level of trust, the consensus is needed. So, it has an institutional power if we compare the European Council with other institutions. And, uh, for example, when nominating the President of the European Commission, uh, the proposal on the candidate will be agreed by the European Council. So, and then it is offered to the European Parliament uh, for, for vote. 
Uh, also, appointment of high representative of the Union for Foreign Affairs and Security Policy, according to Article 18, is done by European Council. Uh, the um, commissioners as entire body, as, as a college, is offered to the European Parliament through Article 17, so that the, uh, again the European Council has a role to play here. And appointing also the executive board of the European Central Bank, now being the institution, including the ECB president. So this all means that the, uh, there's a lot of political role the European Council plays. And uh, I want also to mention the agenda setting role. When speaking about the Commission, we mentioned that Commission is agenda setter, but also European Council um, wants to uh, outline the vision. So they are speaking about leaders' agenda. So the European Council also sets tone in the future vision where European Union should go with respect to the leaders' agenda that is adopted by the heads of state. So, in order to um, trigger the um, new legislative um, output, uh, the European Council has a role to play because in many cases it is just there in the Council conclusion that European uh, Council invites the Commission to come up with a legislative act or with an initiative, or with a strategy, or with an internal discussion. So uh, the text in the European Council, in these Council conclusions, sometimes actually a very short document of uh, some five to ten pages, so the every single word here matters, and this uh, triggers further process also by inviting uh, the Commission to act. So, um, as mentioned before, the European Council is led by, after the Treaty of Lisbon, by a permanent president. The president is a part of the nomination package because when the legislative um, uh, circle uh, starts, uh, so there will be election of five years term uh, commission college, uh, including commission president, including high representative, and also in this package the president uh, portfolio, uh, the, the uh, nomination of the president of the European Council is included. Uh, so to make this a package deal with respect to a geographical balance, gender balance, uh, also political group balance in Europe, so uh, the difference is the President of the European Union is nominated for two and a half years, uh, but by now the Presidents that we had in, in office were also, with the decision of European Council, prolonged, so their term was prolonged. So the uh, President actually, his or her role is that they would assure the continuity of uh, the European Council's decisions. Uh, they would um, enhance the consensus uh, between the heads of state so that uh, the um, agreements can be reached. And also they have an external representation role. But here the article says that, Article 15, says that actually uh, without um, then uh, prejudice to powers of high representative. So there the balance is, has to be struck where the, uh, heads, where the permanent president of the European Council or the high representative or the commission president has a role to play externally. So uh, let me just uh, devote some words to the um, Council conclusions. What is Council conclusions? So what is this um, uh, instrument of, uh, of output, of the, of the meeting output? Um, we have discussed uh, different legal instruments, uh, directives, regulations, decisions. So Council conclusion is not 
it cannot be compared to any of uh, the uh, legal acts, but it is a political agreement. It's a document which is politically binding. It's not a legislative act, um, but it can give rise to legislative acts. So as explained that the uh, Council conclusions may invite Commission come up uh, with uh, future leg legislative um, um, activity. So the um, Council, um, European Council work is prepared by the General Affairs Council consisting of um, either foreign ministers or ministers for European affairs. Uh, the General Affairs Council is, is led and chaired by the Presidency. And um, apart from this formal um, body, General Affairs Council, that will always look into the Council conclusion text, and also see how the member states, um, uh, what the, where the interests are and uh, what the level of agreement is so that we can already before the European Council meeting to some extent predict um, how long it will last. Um, but there is also in practice um, a uh, bit of invisible um, body that prepares the work of uh, a European Council and these are EU advisors to the heads of states and they, they have quite a funny name so, so this group is called group of Sherpas so 27 member states prime ministers or in some cases the, the head of state is a president of the country like in France so they will be EU advisor who will be most informed person and they also interact in order to better prepare um, uh, their heads of state for this European Council meeting. So Sherpas uh, will be present also during the uh, informal discussions and, and preparations of this very important meeting. And the preparation of the European Council actually takes into account input from all the Council formations. So if we have, for example, the European Council deciding on multi-annual financial framework, then the ECOFIN meeting will give input to this. If they would uh, decide on uh, future enlargement, then General Affairs Council will be very important. Or if it's climate change, then ministers of environment would give input to the work through the General Affairs Council up to the European um, Council and Heads of State Division uh, decision. So uh, this means that the European Council is like a tip of the negotiation iceberg and, uh, and also um, the, um, here the long negotiation work of experts, diplomats, ministers come together. So finally, uh, my slide uh, explains, and I call it institutional jungle. Uh, so we have covered in the lecture, uh, another online lecture, uh, the commission, the institution commission, um, which, is, uh, uh, which has the 27 commissioners and the commission presidents. And today we discussed the role of uh, the Council of the EU, uh, consisting of 27 member states, and led by EU presidency for six months period, but also the institution European Council, which is led by the European Council president, uh, being permanent position for two and a half years, um, and. Uh, so the work of uh, this body is also supported by high representative because many issues that European Council would discuss uh, would also deal with um, uh, European Union as a global actor. So there, in many cases, almost every single European Council meeting would address also external relations. 
And then the input from High Representative and Foreign Affairs Council is crucial. And here in, uh, in my slide on institutional jungle, I have put also a slide on external action service, uh, which is not an institution, be careful, it's not an institution, it's a body. And uh, the treaty just says that external action service should support high representative vice president in carrying out uh, the mandate. So there were the Council decision of 2010 that actually defined how this European External Action Service would be set up. Currently it has 139 delegations all around the world. These are EU delegations because EU has a single legal personality. These are not commission delegations, neither they are diplomatic delegations of member states. But uh, they have the headquarters in Brussels, but the headquarters in Brussels closely interact with all uh, missions, all EU delegations abroad, and there are also delegations in international organizations, meaning that there would be EU, EU delegation in Vienna, there would be EU delegation in New York, and, and so on. And, um, and the staff members the diplomatic staff members of the EU delegations would be comprised of the, uh, in like 30% Commission, Council Secretary and Member State Diplomats. But also uh, local staff, um, you know, since the, uh, in, in many countries, in the Western Balkan country, there is a large number of employees in EU delegations. So it's also quite relevant uh, for, for people who have a, a languages and, and professional experience to become part of this EU delegation as being uh, serving as local uh, employees um, on, on, um, and advisors on different political issues. So throughout EU external action service, the EU is actually um, um, ensuring its external relations, external policy, uh, but the external policy and foreign policy and these are, you know, also two, two distinct external policy, much broader. It includes also uh, the competences of the Commission on development aid, on trade, and on, um, on humanitarian aid, on climate, uh, energy, and so on. And so uh, we have to be uh, careful well we, when we speak about the mandate, because the mandate comes you know, from different sources, from different institutions in the headquarters. But uh, the EU delegation works as, as a one entity. Uh, it does not have a consular function, but it is efficient in also providing support in times of crisis. So uh, my final slide uh, introduces uh, actually the objective of uh, EU external action, which in many cases is also part of European Council decisions, and it also deals with um, um, like um, uh, the safeguarding of EU fundamental values um, on uh, human rights um, and um, and also um, I I international law uh, in terms of territorial integrity and so on. It supports democracy and, and um, principles of international law uh, and they are meant to preserve peace and pr to prevent conflicts. And in many cases these EU delegations are also uh, the um, uh, channels through which uh, the EU reaches out to the partners and we know that there are different close relationships partnerships like agreements, deep and comprehensive agreements and, or even negotiation talks with countries on uh, becoming um, uh, EU members one day. So um, with this I would like to uh, thank you for your attention and um, uh, the next lecture, online lecture, uh, will introduce the European Parliament um, as a co-legislator um, of the EU and as a directly elected body uh, which ensures the people's interest in the EU.
thank you for your attention.